take our hymn books and begin with hymn number 488. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt and made me free. I will tell the wondrous story how my lost estate to save in his boundless love and mercy he the ransom freely gave sing oh sing of my redeemer with his blood he purchased me on the cross he sealed my pardon paid the debt and made me free i will praise my dear redeemer his triumphant power i'll tell how the victory he giveth over sin and death and hell. Sing, oh sing, of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon. Paid the debt and made me free. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer. With his blood he purchased me. On the cross he sealed my pardon, paid the debt, and made me free. message tonight in 2 Samuel is a song unto the Lord. Certainly what we've just sung is a song unto the Lord. Here in Colossians chapter 3, this is our scripture reading. Part of this we're going to see what it is to sing unto the Lord. We have here some very clear instruction that's given to church, redeemed ones, after Paul has declared there in chapter 2 that Christ was raised from the grave, verse 13, quickened together. It's not talking about personal regeneration, but that's talking about a together quickening, raising by the Spirit when Christ was raised from the grave once for all. Notice it says in verse 13, having forgiven you all trespasses. When was sin put away? It was when Christ died and his being raised again and those for whom he died raised with him. I wasn't even born yet, but raised with him together with all of those for whom Christ paid the debt, having blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. This doesn't happen when you believe. This was done at the cross. 
And therefore, the Spirit of God grants that faith to believe, to look to Christ. So it's in that sense, here in chapter 3 and verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, ye there mean in the plural, this collective body of elect that were risen with him, seek those things which are above. Why? Because that's where he seeth, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Why is Christ sitting? The work's complete. Was not one chair to be found in the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Those priests never could sit down. But Christ sitting on the right hand of God is what Paul wrote to the Philippians that he came, lived, died, and rose again, and set it on high. And therefore, God has given him a name above every name, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And so this is where we look for everything, for our forgiveness, for our pardon, for our justification, the fact that Christ is there, the work is finished. It's not in here. It's not out there. It's in this one seated in the heavens. And so verse 2, set your affection. Notice it's one. Not affections, but your affection on things above. That's the eye of faith. I'm not talking about a warm, fuzzy feeling. Here, but it has to do with desire. When we know ourselves to be sinners. Where do we look? Where does the Spirit draw us? That affection, really in the original, is just on above. Things is in italic there. On Him who is above. Not on, again, things is in italic, so not in the original. Not on the earth. Not on what there is of the earthly, not even in ourselves. For ye are dead. You say, well, how, how am I dead? Well, when Christ died, I died. When he rose, I rose. So, dead legally to anything by way of sin and condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And your life is hid with Christ in God heard me say as the Spirit is directed that it would sooner be possible for Christ to cease being the Son of God than for one for whom he paid the debt to ever be lost. Because those for whom he died, our life is hid with Christ in God. Hid means God himself, when he looks at Christ, that's what he sees. He doesn't see us. He sees Christ. And when Christ, who is our life, that's talking about our life, that's talking about not only experientially by the Spirit of God, but He is our life legally. As being that advocate, He's our life eternally. If we live forever, it's because of Christ and His work. But when He shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. It's speaking of those that die before he comes again. They're immediately taken into his presence. That's a difference from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, they went to what was called Sheol. Sometimes the translators here called it hell, but it was a place of the dead where all went. But when Christ came and paid the debt and rose again, all those from the Old Testament beginning that were elect to the end of time rose together with him. And when he shall appear, we shall appear with him in glory. So therefore, mortify your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and looky here, and covetousness, which is idolatry. It says to mortify it, it just means to consider that these very sins that so easily beset any one of us, whether it's in action or thought, there's not one thing you can read there, but what I have to say, I'm a fornicator, I'm unclean. Inordinate affection, anything that is other than 
affection for Christ alone, evil concupiscence, covetousness, coveting anything that uh, we don't possess perhaps is idolatry, but consider those things dead. In other words, they have no power over us to condemn us. I'm thankful. Because it says, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. That's how the Lord's made the distinction. Either these sins were put to the cross, and these were what were, the law was contrary to us, either Christ has paid that debt, or then for these things sake, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. If you wonder what makes the difference, it's Christ, it's his grace, that's it. In our nature, we are as many others, children of wrath, wrathful children. But it says, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. It's interesting how people today tend to classify certain sins as being worse than others, but Paul is as much saying that anger, wrath, malice, and blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth is just as evil as fornication, uncleanness, inward affection, evil concubines, and coaches, which is idolatry. Lie not one to another. So does the grace of God make a difference in those in whom Christ has been revealed? Absolutely. There's that restraining hand that it keeps us from going the way we would go. But we're still by nature exactly what's described here. Who can say they don't get angry or don't hold grudges or don't have malice? But all of those things, if Christ has paid the debt and the Spirit is so revealed him in us, then it affects how we live. Why not one to another? Seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. The old man there has to do with that. If Christ has redeemed us, we're no longer under the old man Adam. So we don't live as if we're still in his household. We're not. And have put on the new man. Who's the new man? That's Christ. To put him on by faith. That Spirit of God gives that faith which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So people have trouble with that, but Christ is that new man who was created. You say, how was he created? Not as God, but as a man. He was conceived in a womb. When you think about what creation is, it's taking something from nothing. So when the Spirit of God conceived our Lord in that womb, there was a new creation created in holiness and righteousness, who knew no sin. And so to put him on, we do that by the renewing in knowledge of him, grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. The more we are taught of him, the more the Spirit of God gives us eyes to see him, the more our eyes are directed to him and not on the things of earth. This is true of any who are the Lord's. There is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in and all. So any divisiveness that there might be over culture and languages and people, etc., in Christ, that all goes away. Can't look at somebody of a different color or culture or language and say, well, they're of less significance. If they're in Christ, we all have the same righteousness. We all share in the same grace. And so put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Here it is, holy and beloved, holy in Christ, beloved of God, bowels of mercy, kindness humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, 
some that are arguing today, all you need is sound doctrine. All you need is the knowledge of Christ and Him crucified, and the rest doesn't matter. Well, go ahead and rip all these scriptures out of the Bible then. Do so. You're blaspheming really against the Spirit, His work. Because this is how He works in wretched sinners. It's not in this flesh to be kind or merciful or humble of mind or meek and long suffering. But where that is manifest in any measure, it must be that the Spirit of God, by His grace, is working through this vessel. That's it. Forbearing one another, forgiving one another. I'll tell you, some of the meanest people out there are what who call themselves grace believers. They're quick to draw the sword and stab separate, divide. It says, if any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Don't try to respond or get back. I'm going to show you how has God dealt with us. It's unconditional love. If my sins were put away at the cross, for what then am I going to attribute to another their sin? Above all these things, put on charity. That's that love for one another, which is the bond of perfectness. Doesn't mean that we're made perfect in these things, but it's a demonstration. The bond of perfectness is a demonstration of having been made or declared just right before God um, because of the work of Christ. So what for what reason would I then even lash out against another who's the Lord's? Hold them in contempt. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. There's where it takes place in the heart. There's a bunch of people walking around with a head knowledge and boy, they can get 100% on the questions, doctrinal, and yet have no love for the brethren. Don't care. In fact, they'll accuse you of Preaching works because you preach these as evidences or the fruit of what Christ has accomplished at the cross. But here's the difference. Let the peace of God, that peace of God that was established there at the cross, that Christ obtained for us on behalf of the Father, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Christ is revealed, it's in the heart. And it's speaking again collectively as a church, as a congregation, as a people, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ, notice distinctively singular, the word of Christ, dwell in you, again it's talking about the church, called out ones, richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. I pray that when I say, well, let's turn in our hymn books to sing, I will sing of my Redeemer. Let the Spirit direct our hearts to sing those words to the glory of Christ and, and truly think about what it is we're saying. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. See, that's the difference. I know some say, well, even the reprobate can be kind once in a while, or the reprobate can be meek, something that not in this way. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving him all the glory. That's a reprobate can't do that. He'll do it for himself serving reasons. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. These are all relational instructions that are given here, whether it's in the church or whether it's in the home. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest ye be discouraged, or they be discouraged. 
Again, this is addressed to people whose sins have been put away. They're at Calvary. Does that affect me as a father, as how I deal with my children? Yes. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So there's the difference. Knowing that the Lord of the Lord, he shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. It's not saying rewards, it's singular. And the reward is the inheritance. <laughs> and the inheritance is to be Christ's forever. So being Christ now, we do so with that hope and knowledge, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive. In other words, none will be cast off whom the Lord has redeemed and whom God the Father has justified. That's why we serve the Lord Christ, because of his work. But he that doeth wrong, Doing wrong means to set aside his grace, just like Cain, rather than go and get the blood sacrifice. He stewed in his anger toward Abel to the point where he eventually killed him. He shed Abel's blood rather than shed the blood of a, an innocent animal as God had commanded. To do wrong is to do anything contrary to this truth of Christ and who he is and what he accomplished at the cross shall receive for the wrong which he hath done and there is no respect of person. But when it says receive for the wrong he has done that means condemnation eternal condemnation the only hope for any of us is in Christ and who he is and what he's accomplished gracious father thank you for your word how profound beyond even what we can imagine Pray that what we've heard, read, your spirit would indeed reveal in our hearts, cause us to have that affection which is for Christ alone, and love for your brother, knowing how undeserving we are of your love, and yet you love us unconditionally. Pray that would be manifest in how we deal with one another. So I pray sing it might be unto you as we hear your word preached in this evening that truly our hearts will be drawn to you through your blessed son in whose name i pray amen let's take our hymn books sing one more hymn singing to the lord grace in our hearts hymn number 46 for a thousand tongues to sing. Sing that oh for a thousand languages. Whatever language it is, be to the glory of Christ. Oh for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King. The triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, Tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood does make the foulest clean, his blood avails for me. Hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your 
our Savior come, and lead ye lame for joy. Glory to God, and praise and love be ever, ever give. By saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. Well, we've had an example of what it is to sing unto the Lord, just in how we've read the word, and the Lord's directed us to sing. So that's the title of the message, if you look with me in 2 Samuel chapter 22. You know, we were looking and thinking, okay, well we just have three more chapters to go before 2 Samuel's done. But we could be a while, especially when you read chapter 22. I want to read the entire chapter because this is a song under the Lord. And... It has a message, because 2 Samuel 22, 1 says, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. So that's what I want us to consider, is what is a song unto the Lord, especially as depicted here. Because this whole chapter is a psalm, a psalm of praise. And if you go over to Psalm 18, you'll find that this very chapter here is there in Psalm 18 with very little variation. Now, there's some that say that what we're reading here in 2 Samuel, because David is called the psalmist of Israel. And what we're reading here would have been how the Spirit would have directed him to write this psalm for his own worship. I don't believe that these in Scripture, when they wrote these things, they were thinking, oh, this is an inspired word. They were writing these things as the Spirit directed. But then it was the Spirit that directed that it not be just for them, but it be preserved here in His Word for the church, those that God by His grace is saved. And so when you go over to Psalm 18, that's the hymn book of the church. What was written here in private for David's own worship was then published in the book of the Psalms for the church to sing. You look at what we're about to read here concerning this song unto the Lord. How do, you, how do you tell a song that is truly glorifying to God versus many of these popular so-called Christian contemporary songs that are being sung. Well, it doesn't take much to see the difference. How profound this word right here. And that's why when I started looking at this, I thought there is no way that we could do justice to this portion of scripture. Just reading through it and making a few comments. It is profound. But it's profound in this, that everything that David wrote <laughs> by way of song unto the Lord, again, was representative of how our Lord Jesus Christ would have sung unto his Father. We're going to see that Christ's own worship of his Father was in many times done by song. I don't think we normally think about the Lord Jesus singing. But I'll tell you that we're going to see some scriptures that that was the case. And thankfully so, because we follow his path. So as we read this, I want to read this through without great comment. Think of how this glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you know a song is to God's glory, when it glorifies his son and his finished work. 
So even though coming from David's experience, having been delivered out of the hand of all his enemies, think of this as a resurrection song of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he was raised from the grave, that no enemy could ever lay its hand on him, whether it was sin or Satan or the world, or even the law. The law could not condemn our Lord because he fulfilled it perfectly. And so he said, verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I know we have that hymn, Rock of Ages, that we're going to sing at the end of this message, but here's the original Rock of Ages. <laughs> Cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. You say, well, how did this pertain to Christ? As a man, he sought his entire refuge in his father, who was his rock. And in him he trusted. His father was his shield. He was the horn of his salvation, his high tower into which he ran and sought refuge as a man. God was our Savior's Savior by what he worked out. And because he feared, is the way it says over there in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7, he was delivered. It says, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves of death compassed me, we talk about waves of death, how they would have compassed our Lord Jesus Christ. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. In other words, as a man, this caused him, it's not that he feared an unbelief, but he feared his father. And the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter into his ears. As you read down, if you've got a cross-reference Bible, you're going to see some cross-references over to Psalm 116 where these verses are quoted in other psalms. But all pertaining to Christ in his suffering as a man. David was but a type. Then the earth shook and trembled and the foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. Think about what took place there in Calvary. There was an earthquake. Because he was wroth, who bore that wrath? He did. It fell on him. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth Devoured, coals were kindled by it. If you want to see a demonstration of the wrath of God, don't just look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't look at the days of Noah when God destroyed the world with fire. Look at the cross. He delivered up his son. That delivering up means that that wrath that was due his people fell on him. And I consider that, oh, how holy God must be. He bowed the heavens also and came down. That's speaking of Christ in the flesh. Darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Think about the sun being darkened the day that Christ hung there on the cross. Midday, through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared and the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord and the blast of the breath of his nostrils. 
He sent from above. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. In other words, as a man, he, he passively submitted himself according to God's decree. Peter preached it. That he that was delivered according to the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you by wicked hands have taken it. That was his voluntary submission. Yet yeah, he was delivered out in the resurrection. Once they had finished putting him on that cross, there was nothing more they could do. And doing what they did, they accomplished what God had purposed all along. He prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. When it says they prevented me, it's like Christ said to those that came to get him in the garden. This is your hour. This is the hour of darkness. When they had their staves and spears, all their weapons, the Lord said, why have you come to arrest me with these things? Was I not every day in the temple? And not one of you laid a hand on me, but now is your hour. This is the, the hour of darkness. But the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Isn't that what the voice was heard from heaven saying? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. I guarantee you that if David wrote that pertaining to himself, he wasn't speaking of his righteousness. He was speaking of Christ. But as this scripture pertains to Christ, he was rewarded with what? the justification of those sinners for whom he paid the debt according to his righteousness. That righteousness became an earned and established and therefore God imputed once for all to the account of those for whom he paid the debt. Notice, according to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. There's no sinner can say that. So David clearly prophetically is looking forward to this work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he would accomplish. For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and I have not wickedly departed from my God. How can that be said of us except for in Christ? As we read in Colossians 3, our lives are hid with Christ in God. As our representative, that's the only way we could ever say that we've kept the ways of God and have not wickedly departed from our God. For all his judgments were before me. For his statutes, I did not depart from him. That's talking about what was required of our Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy law and justice, that God might be just and justified. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from my iniquity. And the iniquity that Christ bore was not his own. And he was not rendered sinful because he took on him the sin of his people. That, he took their sin, not their depravity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. That's our representative. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one to whom David looked. This was a song unto the Lord. So even as he was delivered from his enemies, he's thinking about that work that Christ would come and accomplish on his behalf many thousands of years later. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. Again, that's God the Father looking on him who is merciful. In other words, the mercy seat. That's Christ. With the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. It's because of Christ. With the upright man, notice, singular, there's only one upright man, that's Christ. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the forward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. So you're either in Christ, in that purity, which he worked out on behalf of sinners such as we are, or you stand with the forward, the perverse, Anything that man produces is perverse, forward. It's tainted with sin. There's no good thing in 
us. All the goodness is in Christ. And the afflicted people thou wilt save. Christ didn't come to earth and do this for himself. He did it for that people that the Father purposed to save. And he willingly came. The afflicted people. Doesn't say thou shalt hope to save, but thou wilt save. Thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. Who are the haughty but those that think that somehow by their works of righteousness they're going to obtain favor with God? It, there's nothing but condemnation awaits any that live and die in that, that pride. For thou art my lamp. That word is actually the candlestick. Think of the candlestick in the temple. It represented Christ the light. O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. You think about Christ coming in the flesh. There was no man more hated in all the world than him. The contempt that he had, it says he came unto his own, his own received him not. Every day they got up seeking a way to kill him. And yet they couldn't lay a hand on him until it was the time determined by God himself. I have run through a troop. Think about the times when they surrounded our Lord after, in Luke 4, they took him over and wanted to cast him off a cliff, and he walked right through him. By my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a butler to all of them that trust in him. I'll tell you, when I read about his perfection, it says, as for God, his way is perfect. You're not going to attain unto God, I'm not, apart from a, a perfection that answers to God's righteousness and holiness, just as just as he is. Well, where's that to be found? It says the word of the Lord is tried. Who's the word of the Lord? That's Christ. He is the answer to God's perfection. The tried stone, the true stone, the living stone, the stone which the builders rejected. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. You can't go wrong being cast on Christ by his grace. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. Again, think of Christ. Jump back to verse 32. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? Paul said there to the Corinthians, that rock which followed them in the desert was Christ. God is my strength and power. He maketh my way perfect. Again, Christ as the substitute was given the spear without measure that he might perfectly work out this righteousness, earn and establish it. God being with him, making his way perfect. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. This had to be worked out in a man. And that man had to be perfect, tried in every way, but in the end found perfect in answer to God's law and justice. It says, he maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. When this was finished, that's where God the Father put him. Out of the reach of any enemy. I think after the resurrection of Christ, Christ spent 40 days going around and manifesting himself to his own. He was in the land and yet no one saw him. No one could lay a hand on him. When it says, he maketh my feet like hinds feet, think of those gazelle that jump up the mountaintop. They get up so high, you can't reach them. Now our Lord's exalted high, sitting up, sitting on the right hand of the basket. No, no man can lay this, his hand on him. It's finished. It's done. But while he was a man, verse 35, he teaches my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. This is how our Lord learned as a man. He grew in wisdom and stature. And it was a warfare. Not 
just the physical, where they sought to kill him, but the spiritual. Think of the Spirit leading him out in the wilderness for 40 days and being tempted of Satan. He was as a, a man who learned or taught, his hands were taught to war so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. You talk about a bow of steel. That's a strong instrument. Satan fell the best man in the best state there in the garden. You talk about an, an adversary, which is what his name means. And he threw everything he could at our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, our Lord destroyed him. Even before he went to the cross, he says, Now is the prince of this world cast down. And he has nothing in me. I love that. There's nothing in me he can, he can have. If there had been then Christ would no longer be that Savior. Perhaps Satan had enough knowledge, given him natural knowledge to know, because even the devils believe God in trouble, to know that this was his one shot. And just like he fell at him, got to fall, got to bring this one down. Because he is that representative, the last Adam. Verse 36, Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. Thy gentleness hath made me great. See, all the while that Christ was there and in the end enduring the wrath of God, don't think of wrath as being hatred. God never hated his son. Wrath means justice. But all the while that our Lord was working out this justice, it was with gentleness and love for his son that it says there, he made me great. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. There's only one shield of salvation, that's Christ. It's his death, it's what he's accomplished. It's in his hands. Thou hast given me the shield of salvation. And thy gentleness, thy love that made me great. It was in love that Christ came to this world. Love of the Father for him, but also his love for that people that he came to save. That's a particular love. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. There was nothing that could bring Christ down by way of sin or evil. I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. That was Christ and what he accomplished at the cross. They thought to have had the upper hand when they put him to death, but that was the way God, the Father, had purposed that salvation should come. And I've consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You can pursue somebody all the way to death, but once they're dead, that's it. You can't touch them anymore. They're dead. Such was the satisfaction of our Lord Jesus that when he died, it was finished. But when he rose again, it was a demonstration that when he finished that work, it was finished. And every enemy against Christ or any every enemy that ever stood against one of his elect, think about that. What's our biggest enemy? Sometimes we think it's Satan, it's the world. I'll tell you what it is, it's in here. It's, we carry it around with us. But there's nothing in this flesh that could ever cause God to deny the Lord, one for whom he paid the debt. That amazes me when I think about it. What, what makes the difference between you and anybody else out there in the world? I'll tell you, you think just like them. Don't tell me you don't. We carry about in this body this sin. Just like anybody out there in the world. Thoughts, deeds. And yet for none of these can there ever be any condemnation. There's no sin too great in us as an enemy that the justification, free justification of God hasn't answered. Thou hast girded me with the strength to battle. Again, think of Christ. David is speaking this. He was a man of war. But it was as a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under, under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. I'll tell you, it's not a good place to be staying opposed to Christ. Unless God grants repentance, every enemy will perish. That's that word that I might destroy them that hate me. You know, people today think, well, God wouldn't do that, would he? Well, look what he did to his son. Look how he poured out his wrath on his son. You think it's anything for him then to cast out of his presence forever those that hate his son? If you want to find out who loves his son and who hates him, declare him just as he's revealed here in this word. You don't have to say a whole lot. Just read the scriptures. You'll find out. People will say, well, that might be your Christ, but that's not mine. Well, how many are there? They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street and did spread them abroad. There are vessels of mercy and then there's vessels of wrath. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be the head of the heathen. That word heathen means of the nations, a people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Let's talk about the work of grace unto the Gentiles. This was announced even in the Old Testament. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. Close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. All of this is Christ again. He was heard in that he feared. How was he brought forth in that resurrection? Ascension. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Lifted up the right hand of the majesty of, of God. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Verse 50. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord. Notice, among the heathen, among the nations, I will sing praises unto thy name. If you look at a cross reference, you'll see Romans 59. This is actually what Paul quoted as to the reason why he was taking the gospel of Christ to the nations, to the Gentiles. He took a lot of flack from the Jews because he was raised a Hebrew of Hebrews. And now at his conversion, he's going and preaching to the Gentiles, the dogs. Well, it was foretold here in the Old Testament in this psalm of David. Because of that work accomplished at Calvary, that people that the Father gave him, as it says in Revelation 5, 7, from every tribe, nation, and tongue. This is Christ, and this is, we're not going to have time to even get to the message, but we'll see it next time. Come back here. That The song that is sung here, is Christ giving thanks unto his Father among the heathen, singing praises unto his name for these of all kindred, tribe, and tongue that the Father gave him from eternity that he should come and save. There is no difference in his mind between Jew and Gentile, bond or free, barbarian, Scythian. It doesn't matter. In fact, the more vile you might consider somebody because of their race or whatever. The more glorious is the Lord saving them on the same work of righteousness as, as anybody. There, there's not two ways of salvation. He is the tower of salvation for his king. Who's his king? Well, God the Father is the tower of salvation for his king. He said, I have set my king on my holy hill. 
and showeth mercy to his anointed. The word Christ means anointed. Here it says unto David as a type, but you see that last phrase, and to his seed forevermore. Who's David's seed? What's that? One that came in the flesh, born of a virgin. Worked out this righteousness, laid down his life, paid the sin debt, and then rose again. And the book of Acts says when he rose again, it was to sit upon the throne of David. In other words, that promised seed. This is a song. It's taken this time just to go through it and just try to bring out of it small pictures of how this pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll come back to this next time, a song unto the Lord. See how such a song, such songs, this motivates us as we sing. There are a lot of hymns in our hymn book that I look at and I think it's just it's just an empty barrel. There's nothing of Christ, there's nothing of his shed blood, there's nothing in his work. But to sing those that do give him all the glory. So put your finger right there and Lord willing we'll come back to it next time. Let's take our hymn books and sing him the Augustus top that he wrote rock of ages cleft for me will be dismissed in number 126. The second verse these for sin could not redeem the tone is a cover Christ's death was not a covering it was a redemption a ransom paid Rock of ages, clap for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Could my tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not redeem. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. All right, have a good restful evening, and we look forward to seeing you next time.